I don't have to worry about sabotaging my career, you know. <laughs> I'm always sabotaging my career. It's part of my career. Todd, before he's anything, before he's a record producer, a guitar player, a, a, a songwriter, before he's anything, he's a singer. I hit slightly wrong note, a slightly wrong note. And uh, so his back is to me, and here's how he looked when I sang the wrong note. So that begs the question, Todd, why? Why did you commit so hard to this format? In 1985, Todd Rundgren released a fairly radical album called A Cappella, which featured no instruments except for his voice. Now this may sound commonplace, but his voice was sometimes processed to such extremes as to sound completely inhuman. In fact, tracks like Blue Orpheus and Miracle in the Bazaar have sounds that I wouldn't even know how to produce with modern sample libraries and plugins. <laughs> Armed with only a monophonic sampler keyboard called the Emu Emulator, he put decades of studio engineering experience and his incredible imagination to the test. Somehow, he reproduced the sounds of electric and upright bass, vibes, acoustic and electronic drums, cymbals, synthesizers, distorted guitar, and entire percussion kits. I mean, it's truly stunning to listen to this album and think, all of this sound came from one guy and some studio gear. Acapella features otherworldly atmospheres like on Miracle in the Bazaar, Gilbert and Sullivan silliness on Lockjaw, upbeat doo-wop on Hoja, catchy pop on Something to Fall Back on, and the heartbreaking ballad Pretending to Care. It's really such a diverse and adventurous listening experience. As you'll hear from Todd himself, some of these tracks required some serious studio knowledge, which very few musicians had at the time. Acapella paved the way for artists like Mike Patton and Bjork to release their own vocal-only records. It also had significant influence on modern acapella groups, who now perform some of the actually performable songs as standard repertoire. Heck, even the show Full House featured John Stamos covering Hoja and doing a pretty good job at it. Now, after the album's release, Todd brought a small choir on the road and performed much of the album live. We met with Todd and members of the a cappella tour to discuss this unusual and innovative musical effort. We think this is an album that, 37 years after its initial release, deserves some serious attention. Drummer Greg Bendian, who toured with Todd between 2011 and 2018, led these interviews, and you should check out his excellent channel, The Progcast. All right, on to Todd. Your a cappella record, besides being a fan favorite, is, is such an interesting intersection of so many things in the middle of the 80s, if you will. I was looking at antecedents to this album a cappella mm -hmm. and as you well know on uh runt there's a piece called there are no words mm -hmm. well my question to you todd is swingle singers beach boys much a uh, bit of that a um, bit of all that um some of it is uh, direct influences and some of it you know it's still rel relatively early in my songwriting uh, career and as I'm listening to it I'm realizing that it's as much me exploring the possibilities of the piano as it is the possibilities of the vocal I'm quite obviously like putting my hands on these clusters of notes on the piano and just moving my fingers around kind of randomly until it moves into a recognizable chord and so a lot of my uh, early experimentation, because that's on my first solo album. A lot of it had to do with my um, exploiting the piano as a compositional tool. Uh, previously, I didn't really own a piano and was limited by whatever it was that I could write on the guitar. 
How you like the uh, the uh, accompaniment? What is that? <laughs> That's a frog. <laughs> this has been going on for days. We this, we've had a real onslaught of frogs here since <laughs> the storm. Oh man, Anthony! And all all night long, driving me crazy. Anthony, pull up Todd Rundgren frogs. Yeah, and they will, and they won't shut the hell up. I got my BB gun. I'm ready to go hunting. And what is the sound of a plummeting frog? It's a sickening flap like a rock in a bog. That's so much fun, Todd. You know, it's really funny how at the end of the day, as heady as your stuff is, it's also really fun. Um, well, I like to have fun while I'm making it. You know, there are sometimes the fun is overcoming a challenge. Um, and then often the fun is exploring some new area of music or, or even in that particular case, almost sort of tributing, uh, early influences like Gilbert and Sullivan and Breck and Weil and that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, I've always thought that, um, music needs to be motivated by, um, by a sense of fun or a sense of urgency or something. It needs some motivational thing. You can't just be doing it because you think people will like it and give you money for it. You know, it's, it, for me at least, has to have some personal reward, which in many cases is just having some fun with it. Uh, there's a clip of you on Entertainment Tonight from, what, 84 or 85, I guess, something like that. And you're showing how you're using the emu, and you're singing. You you hold the microphone up, you sing a note, it captures the note, and then you press a key and show how it works. How much could you have at your disposal in terms of a palette? Was it one or two sounds in terms of the memory capabilities of this thing? And how were you building? Like I'm guessing you couldn't work on multiple songs at the same time. You really had to focus. So could you talk a little about the compositional approach? to some of these songs using, given the constraints of the hardware? Well, yes, the emulator was a monophonic instrument. It only ever made one note at a time. You know, uh, it was not a multi-sampler, and I didn't get a multi-sampling instrument until I got like a, a Fairlight some years later. But uh, yes, I could sing into a microphone and get a note into the keyboard, but then there was no... Uh, there were no uh, uh, standardized sequencers at that point. So, for instance, if I'm doing like a drum track, you know, doing beatboxing, which became very popular later, you know, you overblow the microphone and it sounds like a bass drum or something or another kind of drum. I would have to play it by hand all the way through the song. You know, by bass drum, snare, bump, that, 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 that. The, the entire song I would have to play. Um, and then if I was doing something like uh, uh, a song like something to fall back on that sounds like there's a keyboard going in the background. I'm actually, I have to play each one of those parts separately. I have to play, you know, the, each note of the triad separately and, you know, and overdub them. So it was much more painstaking than it even looked, you know, because uh, although, although I could capture all these sounds and have some control over them, it was almost more difficult than doing a song like uh, Pretending the Care that was just all vocals sung along to a, a piano track that I later deleted. So, so all those, what you're saying is the, the, the chords on something to fall back on. Yeah. It's not. It's. It is your voice. It is my <laughs> but voice. But you couldn't. You couldn't play a triad at the same time. So you had to overdub to get the triad. So that's yeah. what three tracks basically that you yeah. would bounce down to one or something. You could. You could multi-sample. In other words, you could put a different sound on a different key, but you could only play one key at a time. That's so, incredible. So I could put like a drum. I could put like a drum set of vocal sounds in there. You know, but as long as I'm only hitting one thing at a time, you know, 
it, it would work. But if I had, you know, I couldn't play chords. So I have the, the clip here. Later. The manner in which I uh, use this on the album goes something like this. Get a microphone, put it into <laughs> sample mode. Ooh. Put a sample of sound in it. That's what it looks like. You picture it. And then you can play the sampled sound. This is where I sampled it at. So you get some idea what it sounds like. What you hear is my voice digitally encoded into bits and bytes and stored inside the instrument. And it will now play it anywhere on the keyboard that I place my hand. Yeah, but that there is a Fairlight. That's not an emulator. I thought something weird was going. The yeah, Fairlight is Fairlight is polyphonic, but that's a few years later, right? Yeah. It, on the original, it's just one note at a time. Yeah, on the original, recording, one voice at a time. I only had an emulator. It wasn't until after that that I got the Fairlight. So that begs the question, Todd: Why? Why did you commit so hard to this format for this music, this body of work? Well, you know at about the same time that, you know, you know, when I finished something, anything, and I look back on the experience, even though it was, you know, commercially very successful, but I looked back on the experience and, and said, well, musically, well, it was the one thing that started to bother me. And people said, oh, he's the male Carol King. You know, he writes his own songs and sings and stuff like that. And that just bothered me no end, not because of, uh, my opinion of Carol King, but because I didn't want to be compared to another artist. I thought, is this going to be my career? Just comparisons to other people. And so I made a conscious decision that I wouldn't do what somebody else could do. Uh, that I would only do the things that I thought only I would or could do. You know, I will, I would only, do, I'm the only one who would do them because I'm the guy who's also producing records and making money at that. So I don't have to worry about sabotaging my career. You know, <laughs> I'm always sabotaging my career. It's part of my career. And, uh, and the other thing was, uh, that nobody could do. In other words, I, because I was an engineer, a recording engineer, I understood the studio in a way the average artist did not. And so I could visualize the possibilities of what you could do with the studio in a way that an average artist might not. So when it comes to the actual, the composition of a piece, like something to fall back on, where you're sampling your voice, you're, you're playing in chords, uh, one note at a time, whatever, were you th like? Did you write it on a guitar first? Or did you have it in your head first? Like, what what were you doing, and what's that translation process like? Is it just kind of like a building something out of Legos? It's just one small piece at a time, and eventually you get there, or what? Well, not you know, they're all everything is different. You know, even within a record, I don't try and repeat myself within one record. You know, I'll do one kind of thing here and a different kind of thing there, and so. Uh, as I said, something like pretending to care, I played it all on piano first and then sung along with the piano. It's the only way to keep it in sync and keep it tune well. And then I, I simply ditched the piano at the end, so it made it a, an a cappella song. Then there was a song like, for, a, for instance, like Johnny Jingo, in which it was never anything but an a cappella vocal. There was no piano part played on it. All I did was set up that stomping rhythm thing and started singing. Somehow managed to stay in tune through the whole thing. Um, so, yeah, each one was a, a little bit different in, in one way or another, what, what I would play along with. Usually it would be the piano. Most of my composition, and even, you know, by then was being done on the piano. And even to this day, I rarely write. Uh, song on the guitar unless I intend for it to be played on the guitar. Well, then that uh, follows with another question, which is how the hell do you come up with Lockjaw and Miracle in the Bazaar? Uh, well, there, there are different kinds of experiments like um, Miracle in the Bazaar. 
like I say, if I had a, if I had a, a multi sampler, I might have done it with that. But I didn't have a multi sampler, so what I did was, I did every note within an octave. Maybe it was more than an octave. I'm not sure, but I essentially just recorded an ah, you know, tried to keep it as straight as I possibly could onto the two track machine. Uh, then I would loop it. I would physically loop it and then record it to the 24 track. So there would be like three minutes of one note. Ah, like that. And recorded all the notes that I, you know, that I wanted to use in it. And then I essentially played the console, moved the faders up and down, depending on which notes I wanted to hear. That is truly unbelievable. What an idea. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, it's that's like what a, I mean. It's, it's not only something somebody wouldn't do, they couldn't do it because they couldn't figure out how to do all of that, you know, to get the final right, product. Right, right. I mean, if you, heard the fin if you heard the final product and you didn't know the technology involved to make it, you'd say, how the hell did you, that happen, you know? Could, could you hit Miracle for a second, Anthony? This is the most manual possible way to do this. Manual labor, yeah. Yeah, I hope you don't mind my saying that that's still one of the most fucked up things I've ever heard. 